Org. Opinions and claims made by guests and advertisers of Normal Show Live are their own and do not necessarily reflect the philosophy and policies of Normal. Listener discretion is advised. You take a seed, you plant it, you grow it, you dry it, you roll it, you smoke it. You take a seed, you plant it, you grow it, you dry it, you roll it, you smoke it, and it goes down smooth. Hey! Spanning the continent to bring you the truth about cannabis and marijuana law reform. I smoke pot and I like it a lot. From the promise of legalization. Uh, and I think that we need to rethink and decriminalize our marijuana laws. To the agony of prohibition. One major responsibility is to encourage people to use less drugs. The National Organization for the Reform of Marijuana Laws presents... Normal Show Live, Marijuana Nation. Now, here's your host, Normal's Outreach Coordinator, Radical Russ Belleville. Good afternoon, Tokers and Tokats, and welcome. It is Monday, November 7th, 2011, and it's got to be 420 somewhere in the world. Thanks for joining us. We have a great show show in store for you today all sorts of breaking news to get to but before we do that let us introduce in studio here joining me right next to me is the exquisite and delicious cannabis carrie how you doing carrie delicious well i guess i don't know <laughs> Some have said, word on the, street. the word on the street delicious. great to have you here for the show Thank you. I love being here for the show. Uh, except for uh, our hair and makeup person. we gotta, we got to get the, the new hair and makeup person. Anyone out there wants to do hair and makeup for the show, you don't have much to do for me. But, uh, <laughs> hey, wait a second. Why are we starting off the show? Do I not look okay today? No, you say okay. you look fantastic. And, and of course, you've always got the uh, hemp headlines for us at the beginning of the show. So what's in the news? Well, today we're going to kick off the week uh, with talking about an expo that happened on the East Coast. It's a first, but we're going to chat about that a little bit. Also, we're going to go to Rhode Island, where a recent study uh, came out to talk about the uh, adolescent marijuana use, since they've had medical marijuana. And the big news that broke this weekend, uh, a lawsuit that's happening in California. We're going to cover all of that on the Hemp Headlines today. All right. And we will bring that to you right after this first break. And then uh, also some great stuff on today's show. We've got uh, Roots Monday for you today for our Daily Toker Tunes. And on uh, Roots Monday, we're going to be talking uh, about a song from 1945. We're going to play this for you called Four Jumps of Jive. And we all know where the uh, the term jive comes from in the uh, old vibe Viper slang. So bring that to you at 20 after. Then at 30 after, we've got an interview with those aforementioned attorneys, normal attorneys, Matt Cuman and David Michael, who are filing suit in the four federal districts in California uh, with constitutional arguments to end the federal crackdown on medical marijuana in the state of California. They've got some very interesting legal theories uh, to provide in this case, uh, including a Ninth Amendment, Tenth Amendment, and Fourteenth Amendment arguments. We'll get real deep into that on today's show, talking to them at half past and then at the end of the show a little radical rant but uh, not so much a rant as an instructional session i'm going to give you a look behind the scenes at the government's own website the national surveys of drug use and health and how you can do the research yourself to make the arguments on drug policy drug use in america how many people are really smoking pot what does the government have to say about that all the information you need is right out there provided by your tax dollars we're going to show you how to take advantage of that on today's normal show live so stick around we are the voice of the marijuana nation and and all sorts of great breaking news coming up today. Also later on in the week, we've got Dr. Ethan Nadelman from Drug Policy Alliance and Captain Joe Brooks from Leap. And remember, no show Friday. We'll be out of town in Atlanta, Georgia. We're right back after this. This is Normal Show Live, the voice of the marijuana nation. The law offices of Omar Figueroa would like to remind you to stand up for your rights. Please do not give up your precious liberties. There's nothing wrong with standing up for our constitutional rights, and in fact, it's the only way to honor the Constitution that gives us these precious rights. Treat law enforcement with respect and respect the Constitution by standing up for your rights. If you are detained or arrested, stand up for your rights by repeating, I respectfully invoke all of my legal and constitutional rights. I do not consent to any search or seizure. I want to remain silent, and I want to speak with my attorney, Omar Figueroa. Omar Figueroa has more than a decade of experience in federal and California courts and graduated from Yale University, Stanford Law School, and Trial Lawyers College. 
please contact the law offices of Omar Figueroa at 415-489-0420 or 707-829-0215 or on the web at www.omarfigueroa.com. You're listening to Normal Show Live, the voice of the marijuana nation. Weedmaps.com. I'm Radical Russ from Normal. In my job as outreach coordinator, I travel every month, and when I'm on the road, I need a fast, accurate way to find the medical marijuana dispensaries in the area. So I turn to WeedMaps.com. WeedMaps.com has the best dispensary locator online or on your mobile device. Search by zip code or let WeedMaps find you, and in seconds you'll have the addresses, phone numbers, and customer service reviews for the medical marijuana dispensaries in the local area. WeedMaps.com also has a section devoted to helping you find a doctor who understands and recommends medical marijuana under your state's law. You can even check prices on the Medical Marijuana Stock Exchange. Coming soon, you'll even be able to find the listings of normal attorneys and chapters, local head shops and grow shops, and the best weed-friendly businesses. WeedMaps.com has the information you need to be an informed cannabis consumer. Visit WeedMaps.com today. A proud sir of the normal network. Inhaling deeply all the sacred smoke Medical Barrel, it's time for This week's Normal News with Cannabis Carry. The state of Maine held its very first medical marijuana caregivers trade show and festival this weekend. The event was held in the city-owned Augustus Civic Center on Saturday and Sunday. Police and the district attorney's office and city officials had all agreed to allow the event before including the tent. The organized homegrown Maine the first time in the state where medical marijuana users were allowed to use other than the privacy of their own homes. There was a tent set up outside the show where anyone with the proper legal documentation was allowed to enter a tent and could use medical marijuana freely. Patients and advocates alike were able to enjoy the day and called the event a step forward for all main medical marijuana patients. The medicating tent was placed in full view of trade show guests and passing law enforcement through the doorless entry after the civic the unusual nature. The two-day event was hosted of Maine, a patient giver that knew all, all the rules and the law and the experts, including Dr. Lester Grinspoon, Dr. Dustin Solek, and speakers from the Maine Civil Liberties Union. The on Saturday until live music and continued on Saturday. Organizers say that's the first event, but it will not be the last there already. All right. All right. Well, you know, Maine medical marijuana is kind of an interesting situation because, uh, you know, they have a fairly good law there. They uh, allow for uh, a great number of plants. But the, the problem is, is we don't have a whole lot of patients that are covered by that Maine medical marijuana law. Uh, they a registry statistic online. Their registry is, uh, could be a voluntary registry at that. I registry in anymore. There's been a lot of changes to the Maine medical marijuana law. Uh, we encourage you to check out normal.org. Look under our medical use section and you can find all the information you need on the relevant statutes and applications if you're in. As far as the event goes, these medicating areas at these events are becoming fairly standard, uh, fairly commonplace. I've been to a lot of California California and Colorado, Oregon, and so on, where uh, we do set up these medication uh, areas. The uh, worry that I have about them, though, is the perception that it might play uh, into our opponents' hands that uh, we don't see these similar types of medicating areas uh, for other sorts of symptoms or other sorts of medicines. I think it's important as reformers and advocates that we're very quick to point out that there are medication areas for every other type of medicine out there. They're called Everywhere, you know, you can take your Vicodin, you can take your Oxycontin, you know, at a restaurant, at a club, at a concert, wherever you want to go. At an expo, you're free to have your bottle of pills and, and take the pill when you need to. Medical marijuana being an inhaled patient makes things a little bit more difficult. Let's point out that we're not any sort of right other people don't get with asking for the exact same rights that everybody else already has with their prescriptions. Uh, recently, from Rhode Island, Adam marijuana emergency Rhode Island hospital 
but along with her co-authors, looked at marijuana use in teenagers since 2006 when the state opened up to legalize medical marijuana. Opponents of that measure in 2006 warned the public that to legalize Legalized medical marijuana would lead to increased marijuana use among Maine's youth. They also looked beyond their state's border for the study. The researchers compared trends in adolescent marijuana use in Rhode Island and Massachusetts, a state they said they chose because it uh, reflected them geographically and politically. And they used the Youth Risk Behavioral Surveillance System, and they did that between 1997 and 2009. Those studies, 32 found period. There were no statistically significant differences in marijuana use between the states in any of those years. They found no increase of adolescent marijuana use related to the state's 2006 passage of their medical marijuana law. Dr. Chu explained her results to the American Public Health Association at their annual meeting exposition, exposition in Washington last week. That the study did not find any adolescent marijuana. We did need additional research to track any future trends as medical marijuana in Rhode Island and other states becomes more widely used. But for now, the findings suggest that legalization of medical marijuana has no influence on teenagers' drug use. You know, this is something that uh, I wanted to take a look at as well when I heard this these kind of information come out. So I made a map, you know, like I want to do. I often make maps and graphs when I want to try to understand something. And so I made this one and I compared the 2002-2003 uh, National Survey on Drug Use and Health Information to the 2008-2009 estimates for each state and for the 12 to 17 year old age group. So basically it was from 2003 to 2009, how did teenage use change? Did it go up? Did it go down? And I highlighted with these little uh, outlines the medical marijuana states that existed in 2003 so we could see if in those states was there a raise from 2003 to 2009. And then also for comparison's sake, what about the rest of the country? I mean, if the rest of the country went up or down, wouldn't that also affect the medical marijuana states? Now, in this graph that you can see or this map that you can see on the webcam right now, all of the states that you see in some shade of blue are the states where teenage marijuana use went up between 2003 and 2009. That's right, don't adjust your monitors, it's just three states, California, Colorado, and in Wyoming. And the increase in California and Colorado was less than 5%. One of them was like a 1% increase, one was a, about a 3% increase, whereas Wyoming was an over 5% increase, and of course, Wyoming doesn't have medical marijuana. Meanwhile, we see a lot of the states that do have medical marijuana, like Washington, Oregon, Nevada, Alaska, and Hawaii, all out there in the West Coast that everyone thinks is such the big marijuana area of the country, all saw decreases in teen use of marijuana from uh, 10% or less uh, in the decrease. And then when we look in the northeastern states, Vermont had a huge decrease, like 25% decrease. Maine's decrease was over 20%. So it is a ridiculous argument to try to make that medical marijuana passage is going to have an effect on any sort of teen use of marijuana. Uh, the use of marijuana by teens owes to a lot of different factors, but medical marijuana laws are not one of them. And we've been covering that crackdown on medical marijuana dispensaries and businesses since four U.S. attorneys sent threatening letters to landlords and business owners demanding that they shut their doors. Today, a lawsuit was filed simultaneously, excuse me, on Friday, a lawsuit was filed simultaneously in three different districts in California where the U.S. attorneys have threatened criminal prosecution of both tenants and landlords and unbelievably newspaper publications. The lawsuit is being waged in San Francisco, the northern area, Sacramento, the eastern area, and Los Angeles in center central uh, area. Additionally, Representative Brian Bilbrey, a Republican from San Diego, his as a plaintiff in an additional loss. She is a 25-year-old cancer survivor who, who is arguing of patient cooperatives that provide safe legal access to medical cannabis. She told the LA Times today, quote, not only is the U.S. attorney infringing on my right as a California resident to obtain the medicine I need, but she is punishing me by making it more difficult to get the one thing I really need as a patient. She called imaginable. 
Well, Matthew Cuman, along with a few other attorneys, is filing that suit against the U.S. government and says that the people of California will fight back against this latest assault on medical marijuana. He says that this organized effort to get the fight into court will send the message to the federal government that we need to stop the aggression and sit down and talk about it reasonably. The initial complaint was filed in all four cities on Friday morning informing the defendants, who are Attorney General Eric Holder, Drug Enforcement Administration Chief Michelle Lionheart, and the U.S. attorneys, that they will seek an immediate order from a federal judge to stop the crackdown on cooperatives, property owners, and the businesses that support them. Can you tell us more, Russ? Yeah, this is a really interesting. I've got a copy of the brief itself, and it's available up at the Normal blog at blog.normal.org. I wrote this up today. You can download the PDF for yourself. And then later on in today's show, at a half past, we're going to speak with Matt Cuman and David Michael, uh, the two normal attorneys who have filed this. And I just wanted to point out that, you know, people sometimes are, what does normal do? Normal's not ever doing... I'll I'll tell you one thing normal's bad at, and that's tooting our own horn. But, you know, kind of odd saying that is, toot your own horn. Well, who else is going to toot your spit-filled horn anyway? I'll toot our horn. What normal does. This is what attorneys do. These two attorneys, Matt Cuman and David Michael, they're being aided by Alan Silber out in New Jersey. Also, a, a, a whole lot of expert testimony in this, in this uh, suit, in briefs filed by our own, and all sorts of expert testimony and research provided by California Normal's Dale Geringer. This is what we do. So I just stay tuned for more detail on it. But I'll give you the on in the suit. They're attacking on a lot of different angles. One angle is an entrapment angle. That in 2009, in the uh, Santa Cruz Wham against Eric Holder, the Department of Justice judge it changed its policy toward the relative to you remember the Ogden, the, the Ogden memo, the Holder pronouncement, you know, we wouldn't go after uh, lawful uh, marijuana patients. Well, that got entered into court in the Santa Cruz Wham case. So what they're saying here is once that was official, once that was entered into court, California providers had a reason to believe that the federal government wasn't was legal. There's in here one called judicial estoppel, another one that's called equitable, and they both kind of, the, the notion that if the authorities say that something is legal or is not going to be prosecuted and you go forward in good faith with that notion, with that knowledge, and then they come back and bust you later, they can't really do that. It's, it's the old entrapment kind of uh, uh, idea if you think of old TV cop shows that don't really explain it correctly. Now, there's a, a few other constitutional arguments as well. One is a Ninth Amendment art in the Constitution. For those of you that makes class, it says... The enumeration in the Constitution of certain rights shall not be construed to deny or disparage others retained by the people, which is the old uh, 18th century way of saying, just because the Constitution doesn't say you have a right, doesn't mean you don't have that right. I mean, really, if they were going to write down every possibly have, have as a person, the Constitution would be, you know, uh, an encyclopedia. You have the right to breathe air. You have the right to drink water. You have the right to, you know, it, it would take forever, right? So that's what the Ninth Amendment's all about, is that there are rights that the people have. Just because we put rights in the Constitution doesn't mean that the people's rights necessarily go away. And so what they're trying to argue here, our normal attorneys are arguing that threatening to seize people's property and engage in and criminal prosecutions against them violates the rights of the people to consult with their doctors about their bodies and health, something that's been uh, approved in, or been recognized in other court cases of one, as one of the rights of the people, the right to visit a doctor. There's a Tenth Amendment argument in this, and of course the Tenth Amendment is power is not delegated to the United States by the Congress, nor prohibited to it by it to the states are reserved to the states respectively or to the people. Uh, a Tenth Amendment just basically is the states' rights argument in the Constitution. And the normal attorneys are arguing that the states have the power to regulate medicine. And since the federal government's coming down on Colorado, or on California, but not coming down on Colorado, you're trying to assert that Colorado has some sort of states that California doesn't have. And that's a, you know, a Tenth Amendment thing that we can argue there. Uh, in the 14th Amendment argument they have here, that's equal protection under the law, that you can't be discriminated against differently from state to state. They argue that since the federal government is currently giving medical marijuana to four surviving investigative new drug program patients, LV Musica, Irv Rosenfeld, George McMahon, and the uh, other anonymous patient, since the federal government is giving medical marijuana and producing medical marijuana for four federal patients, and since they're allowing Colorado to go forward with their state-run dispensary 
program that it is a violation of our 14th Amendment equal protection. You cannot treat Californians differently than you treat Coloradoans. And LV and I and patients. So this is a part of their argument. We'll be talking to them more about this in our and uh, we'll get to that right after this break. Excellent. We got some uh, jazz coming. Nineteen forty tune. Yes. It's. We have to take a short break, if you know what I mean. Please support these sponsors who support Normal Show Live. Oh, have you ever met that funny reefer man? A reefer man. Have you ever met that funny reefer man? A reefer man. If he said he swam to China, he would sell you South Carolina. Then you know you're talking to that reefer man. Alternative Medical Choices offers healthcare the way it should be. Easy to access, patient-centered, team-based, and quality-focused. We offer a variety of natural, affordable healthcare treatment options like primary care, group acupuncture, massage, and with only P registration. As a patient, you will have a team of experts working with you to make you the best you can be. Call Alternative Medical Choices at 503-288-5579 or check us out on the web at altmedchoices.com. The children! My God! Won't somebody think of the children? Have you considered medical marijuana and peer-reviewed sudden cannabinoid therapies to be successful in treating the symptoms of Alzheimer's disease, ALS or Lou Gehrig's disease, brain cancers, chronic pain, diabetes mellitus, dyspnea, eye disorders, hepatitis C, HIV AIDS, hypertension, incontinence, MRSA, multiple sclerosis, osteoporosis, pruritus, rheumatoid arthritis, sleep apnea, and Tourette's syndrome, as well as anecdotal evidence suggesting relief from anxiety, depression, and post-traumatic stress, plus reduction in the need for narcotic painkillers. Side effects of medical marijuana can include euphoria, relaxation, anxiety, panic reactions, paranoia, tachycardia, dry eyes, dry mouth, concentration and reaction time impairment, appetite increase, and in 37 states, arrest and incarceration. But medical marijuana is non-toxic and cannot cause overdose. Medical marijuana. It's not for everyone, but ask your doctor if medical marijuana may be right for you. Well, Mr. Marsh, it looks like you are in perfect health. Your blood work came back great and all your vitals appear normal. All right! Yep, you check out fine. That's great. So, can I get a referral from you? For what? Medicinal marijuana. There's a shop that opened in the old KFC, and they said I needed a doctor's referral to buy weed. Mr. Marsh, you don't qualify for medicinal marijuana. But you said I'm totally healthy! Medicinal marijuana is for people who aren't healthy. AIDS patients, cancer patients, you know, people going through chemo. The THC helps them eat and take the pain. You are in fine shape. Well, that sucks. It's time for your daily toker tunes. It's in 420 friendly music from all genres that forms the... Today we bring you tunes for Roots Monday, our celebration of the music that evolved into the popular modern music of today. We pick the best of blues, country, folk, and jazz with a 420 feel and serve it up for you every Monday. If you song to be played played on Normal Show Live, send it to us at stash at normal.org. Now here's some more great independent marijuana music for today's Daily Toker Tunes. All right, before we get to today's tune, I just want to make a booking announcement. On tomorrow's show, Tuesday, we'll be speaking with Ethan Nadelman, the executive director of the Drug Policy Alliance. He's got a great piece, an op-ed up in the New York Times today called Reefer Madness and a great uh, basic primer on what's going on, crackdown, and our complaint complaints against it and uh, we'll have Ethan on tomorrow's show to talk more about that in depth so uh, check that out we've got it up on our blog at stash.normal.org uh, we've also got up at the blog this next tune uh, brought to you uh, for your Roots Monday pleasure uh, called Four Jumps of Jive that's the band and the song is called Satchel Mouth Baby I'm hoping that's a 1940s term of endearment uh, according to Bruce Eater at the All Music Guide the Four Jive 
was a quartet formed by Willie Dixon in the late 1945 with Gene Gilmore, Bernardo Dennis, and Ellis Hunter. Their sound, a mix of R&B harmony, vocal, and blues, was getting them a serious following in Chicago, and they might have gone on to a major recording career, but the group didn't last long enough. They recorded for Mercury Records in the company's early days, including Satchel Mouth Baby and It's Just the Blues. Gilmore and Hunter left the group in 1946, and Leonard Caston, an old friend of Dixon's, came into the lineup, which was christened the Big Three Trio, making pretty much the same kind of music as the Four Jumps of Jive for the next decade. So, band only lasted one year, 1945 to 1946, probably because they got the band photo. As soon as you get the band photo, somebody's got to leave. <laughs> but this is uh, the great blues band Willie Dixon uh, with the Four Jumps of Jive, bringing you a little Satchel Mouth Baby here for your Daily Toker Tunes Roots Monday on Normal Show Live. <laughs> Satchel Mouth, baby We can have a lot of fun Yes, a lot of fun Because you are You're the cutest one Are you so sweet? Are you so neat? When you're walking down the street Everybody says, baby Baby, you're the cutest one Are you so handsome? What a break for me of that song for your iPod? Check out the Daily Toker Tunes at the Stash blog by surfing to stash.normal.org and choosing media and then Toker Tunes from the main menu. Been busted? Need a lawyer? Call the Normal Legal Committee for an attorney near you. Find one at norml.org. Remember, attorneys are cheaper than a lifelong criminal drug record. It's that freedom. Freedom. I'm free to do it. As High Time Senior Cultivation Editor, I'm often called into the field and asked to sample or even identify exotic strains of marijuana in their natural habitat. Now, for the first time, I've compiled more than 120 of my favorite strains into this single field guide designed to fit into your pocket as you travel the world in search of your favorite plant. 
From Friends Closet Grow Room to the wilds of Northern California, this single guide covers all of today's best-known strains, plus heirlooms and throwbacks, including high times quality photos and information on each variety's genetic heritage and growing characteristics, plus my personal notes on aroma, flavor, and potency. So this is Danny Danko, author of the official High Times Field Guide to Marijuana Strains, wishing you good times and great ganja. The official High Times Field Guide to Marijuana Strains is available at hightimes.com and finer bookstores. I want the people to know that they still have two out of three branches of the government working for them, and that ain't bad. Hi, this is Alan St. Pierre, the Executive Director of Normal. We are the oldest, largest, and best-known marijuana law reform organization in America. And it's all because of your support. Take some time to join Normal at www.normalnorml.org. Your membership supports this podcast, our websites, our policy research and analysis, and our annual conferences. Changing marijuana laws is a grassroots effort, and it starts with you, the stakeholder. Join Normal today and add your voice to the millions of cannabis consumers who demand equality with our beer drinking friends. In the marijuana law reform movement, the cannabis community is represented by two separate yet equally important groups the consumers who use the cannabis and the defense attorneys who represent these consumers. These are their stories. It's time for reforming marijuana laws with the Normal Legal Committee. All right, welcome back, everybody. We are getting our attorneys on the line, Matt Cuman and David Michael, uh, regarding this uh, this lawsuit that's just been filed in the federal districts. And let's see if we've got them on the line. David, are you there? David, do we have you on the line? Matt? Uh, I believe David and Matt are talking on a different line. You're calling into Cuman Summers right now trying to link in with them? Yes, I am. Okay, and who is this? This is Russ Belville from the uh, Normal Podcast. Thanks. Hold on, please. All right. We'll get that call uh, arranged here. We're doing it live. Uh, for those of you just joining us, the uh, lawsuits are filed in the four federal districts in uh, California regarding the recent federal government crackdown on medical marijuana. Uh, many of the things going on here are things that are addressed in the uh, the Ethan Nadelman post that I referred to recently about uh, uh, the, uh, the uh, recent federal crackdown, including the uh, Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms, which has... Uh, D- design- d- directed the, uh, the the sellers of weapons and ammunition to not sell. To- hey, yes, hello. This- Hi, Russ. It's Matt. Hey, Matt. Glad to have you here, Matt Cuman from Cuman Summers on the line with us. One of the uh, attorneys from Normal that's fi- filing this lawsuit. How you doing? I'm doing great. How are you doing today? Uh, having a good time, getting the show done live here, like usual. Uh, pretty hectic day for me, and I'm sure got to be more hectic for you. Tell us about the uh, the press conference you just got back from. Well, we had it in our office. We had probably about 60 people, members of the medical cannabis community, but a lot of mainstream media, New York Times and Chronicle, San Francisco Chronicle, and uh, a lot of press, and uh, it went very well. Uh, we're, um, launched, we, as we were having the press conference, we were actually literally sending notices to the uh, U.S. Uh, attorney, uh, Eric Holder, and to the individual U.S. attorneys, uh, notifying them that we would be filing a uh, temporary restraining order tomorrow morning, which is what we're going to be doing. And um, everything's uh, everything's uh, pretty moving pretty quickly. All right. And I think the uh, the only bad thing to uh, say from a timing standpoint here would be uh, the announcement of the Conrad Murray trial ver- verdict. It's probably going to take the news headlines today. But uh, you say you got pretty good reaction there from the, uh, the news media? Hey, Russ, you're breaking up a little bit. I, I can't hear you at oh, all there. Oh, sorry about that. I was just trying to get uh, David on the line as well. I think they're having some problems with that connection. I was just saying, uh, from a news uh, standpoint, kind of bad luck that the Conrad Murray verdict came in today, uh, the uh, guilty of uh, manslaughter in the Michael Jackson case. Might steal a few headlines, you think? Uh, sure. <laughs> Anything can, you know. Yeah. Uh, so as far as this uh, this lawsuit goes, I know that uh, Americans for Safe Access had also filed a lawsuit. Tell us Correct. about uh, about how this may differ from previous attempts to protect Californians. Well, the well, you know, ASA is a great, you know, they do great work for patients. Uh, the, the big difference in the lawsuits is that we filed for immediate injunctive relief. Uh, 
their their complaint uh, did not do that, um, and they have different agendas, and they're going to move their thing along, and they've got a, a plan, I'm sure. They also put a Tenth Amendment claim in as the only claim. What's different with our lawsuit is we had a number of different constitutional challenges, um, particularly one uh, that um, uh, I think is particularly compelling and interesting, and we're hoping that the the judges who look at this will feel the same way. Yeah, we gave a brief overview of this in the news, and I'd like to get into some detail on this. Uh, the first couple of uh, things in your uh, request for relief here had to do with estoppel uh, versions, ju- judicial estoppel and equitable estoppel, and kind of right. this idea that the government said they weren't going to be prosecuting anyone, and so now people right. believed it, and they went ahead and did it. But wasn't that just a, a memo? Did that hold legal value, or there was something about the Santa Cruz Wham case that... that plays into this. That's right, and uh, God, thank God, such intelligent radio interview is fantastic. The Wham case, as you may know, Russ, was brought uh, by a group of patients against the federal government in the Northern District Federal Court, and after many years of litigation, when the Wham plaintiffs were finally allowed to proceed forward and were about to send out notices to have the government officials come into a lawyer's office and answer questions about federal drug policy and really, really put the pedal to the metal, uh, the government realized what a disaster that would be. <laughs> they dra- they drafted, hurriedly drafted a three-page memorandum, now called the Ogden Memorandum, some people call it the Holder Memorandum, uh, but the Department of Justice calls it the Marijuana Guidance. And it, standing by itself, it would have been nothing more than just a kind of guidance. But what they did was they actually ran into court and said to the judge, you know, Your Honor, we have a new policy. We're not going after these folks. And you can attach this policy to that stipulation for dismissal that we're all going to agree to, and these folks are going to get to go back and do mm-hmm. their thing. We're not going to bother them, and we're going to go away, and we have this new policy now. And policy says we're not going to go after patients who are in compliance with state law. Yeah, so so Wham well, brought it to a point where they were going to be forced to come in and talk about, you know, what's actually going on in drug policy and they said no nah, we don't want to talk about it besides we're not going to go after you guys anyway and so everybody right. bought right. that everybody believed well if they're not going to go after us <laughs> and that's where we're at now and that's in, in that, so that's a judicial estoppel but the, the reason that judicial estoppel is different than equitable estoppel is that in judicial estoppel what you got is uh, you have the court you, you got the government jerking the court around yeah you got the government you know telling the judge, hey, you know, judge, buddy, pal, it's all set, here you go, you know, we're going to attach this, and, the, you know, we're going to make all these representations, you know, and you don't want to mess around with federal judges, you're jerking right. them around when you start doing stuff like that. Well, this is a separation fact, of, uh, of powers between the executive and the judicial in this case, you can't have that. Right, right, yeah. right. So, Well, uh, it, it's, it's any party, I mean, you know, parties come into court all the time, but if they don't take a position... Uh, the judges don't really, you know, one of the appellate decisions we cited talked about parties playing, quote, fast and loose, end quote, yeah. with the courts. And the <laughs> courts don't like that. Don't right, like that. right. Now, so, what's different about the, the equitable estoppel is that there, they said this to the public, the public relied on it. People actually did things or didn't do things based on that, that document. And now, you know, all of a sudden, whoa. You know, we relied on that. Now you're changing direction on it. Yeah, kind of, kind of yeah. the old, uh, kind of like what people think of as entrapment. You know, if the cop said do it and you did it, they can't come back later and say, oh, well, you broke the law. But well, the cop said I can do it. Well, I can tell you for sure that if any arrests happen out here in California, and there's uh, the criminal defense attorneys are going to be all over that mm-hmm. uh, that notion of entrapment because that's that's precisely what uh, what uh, what they call it, entrapment by estoppel. And uh, and we're uh, you know very much uh, you know hoping that theory will 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 take have a judge take notice. And finally, uh, you've got um, the fact that in the 15 years that we've had a medical cannabis law in California, you know, uh, and then you add up all the other states that have the law or or have pending legislation. You know, we have six states with pending legislation. Plus, we have like one or two other states. Uh, one of my colleagues, David Michael, on by the way, the, of course, the normal legal committee has been lawyers have been uh, at the forefront of this whole thing. David Michael, Alan Silver, uh, Eric Shevin, um, you know, um, uh, you know, just you know, huge, uh, huge support group of uh, Lance Rogers, uh, uh, Art Hodge. I mean, we had seven lawyers uh, on the legal team for this, mm-hmm. and uh, you know, 
when you look at all the population of all the states and all these other states that even have resolutions about medi- about cannabis having a therapeutic effect, you're talking about 170 million people in the country living in states that have some have recognized cannabis, either are about to recognize it as a medical use or have recognized it or see it in some sort of therapeutic fashion. So we're now over the 50% mark. Mm-hmm. So yeah. we're thinking, you know, the Supreme Court reversed itself in a period of 15 years on its sodomy cases. You know, originally it was the Hardwick case. Right. Back in the, uh, was, I forget the year, but about 15 years later, they reversed itself, and part of it was they said, you know, society's changed. The mores and values of society have changed, and, and we need to recognize that. So they they reversed themselves, and we, we think, uh, and it was also, uh, um, uh, you know, um, there was a lot. There was a uh, there was a lot of uh, uh, a lot of a lot of interest on our part in in pushing an argument that you know f- based on the Rage case, the remand back to the Ninth Circuit after mm-hmm. the Supreme Court ruled, where they talked about you know m- when is there's going to be a time, you know, or I think Judge Stevens said it, or Kennedy Kennedy said there's going to be a time when this is going to uh, need to be changed. You know, when you look at how the U.S. Supreme Court worked uh, over the years, I mean, one of its most significant decisions uh, when the legislature in this country refused and failed to act on racial desegregation, you know, it was our U.S. Supreme Court that stepped in and did that. So courts can do some amazing things when there's a stalemate in society. Yeah. We're speaking with uh, Matt Cuman, one of the lead attorneys, along with uh, David Michael and Alan Silber, filing these uh, lawsuits in four different uh, uh, U.S. districts in California regarding this federal crackdown. And the, the next parts of the argument, I find, are, are very compelling, uh, where you bring up the Ninth, Tenth, and Fourteenth Amendments to the Constitution. And, uh, you know, this is in that... You provide that here's Colorado, a state that's going very far forward on state regulation of medical cannabis industry, and you have the federal IND program, and we've spoken to LV Musica and Irv Rosenfeld on the show, where you got four Americans getting medical cannabis, but for some reason in California, it's got to be shut down. Tell our listeners how that constitutional part works. Well, you know, we, we put that under the equal protection rubric. You know, you, if, you know generally... The government can discriminate against us, you know, I like to use the example of a city that decides it wants to put its factories in the the part of town where the wind's blowing away from the population center. You know, factories may not like it, but the government, as long as they have a rational reason for putting the factories there and the residential area in the other part of town, generally they can do that. All they need is a rational basis for their decisions. They can discriminate. They can make distinctions among all of us. Um, but there's a point at which it's not rational to give out cannabis with your left hand and then forbid it with your right hand. <laughs> and, that's, you know, and that's part of the equal protection problem. What's rational about that? What's rational about, and God knows, we don't want to do anything to hurt the Colorado experiment. We just want to be treated just like Colorado. But what, what's rational about treating the state of Colorado one way and treating us a different way? Yeah. Uh, you know, some, or treating the patients, you know, we should say. Uh, you know, why, you know, and then, of course, you know, or why, why take a policy that says, well, we're we're okay with individuals using cannabis as long as their doctors recommend it, and but we really don't want them to have a supply of cannabis. Yeah, you know, as long so, as they can't you know, get it from anyone. <laughs> you know, it's it's it. So it doesn't really make any sense, and so these go to the equal protection arguments that we were making and that we'll, we will be making throughout the course of this uh, litigation. All right. Now, on the uh, the Ninth Amendment and Tenth Amendment side of this, you've got an argument about threatened crackdowns on landlords and dispensaries and advertisers are getting in between a, per- a person's right to visit their doctor and, and, and learn about medical marijuana and that. Uh, give us a little more detail on how that argument goes. Well, you know, this is, these are fundamental liberty interests. You know, we, 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 what, what could be more personal and private and, and, a, and, and, a, and a cornerstone of who we are than to be able to have a relationship with our doctor and to make healthcare decisions about ourselves, and then we've got a government that's basically getting in the way of that. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that interjection or that inter- interceding in between us and the doctors, uh, and then uh, and then cutting off the supply of the medicine the doctors are saying is good for us. I mean, this is a fundamental problem that the government is uh, is intruding on our on on the right of these states 
to make those fundamental, you know, the states are really the ones in charge of, of regulating issues around health and so forth, and California clearly has decided that medical cannabis is something that should be encouraged as, a, as a, something that's good for the health of the population. Mm -hmm. So the Ninth Amendment argument really is uh, important because it, it, it shows that the federal government has overstepped. Yeah. Now, uh, the trump card the government holds in all of these arguments is the Rach v. Gonzalez case, where they said... Well, not, re not really, Russ. I mean, the trump card is that federal law says that, that cannabis has, has Schedule One has no accepted uh, goal or scientific value. And it's, you know, I mean, this is the trump card. Yeah. Well, what I'm, I'm going to say is they're going to bring it forth and say, well, Rach already decided that the Commerce Clause says that we can do this because marijuana is fungible and wickered arguments about wheat and all that kind of stuff. How does this get around that? How do we get Rach overturned? Well, I think the guidance, or what they called marijuana guidance that I referred to earlier, I think things have changed since the Rach decision came out in 2005. You know, we're, the world is different now, six years later. Mm. The way the world was different when the court revisited the sodomy law case. You know, uh, we've got many more states that are, are uh, have passed medical cannabis laws. We have uh, many more, uh, many more uh, people in those states now that are supporting medical cannabis. So that, so that really, you know, even though the commerce that that, that the rage case said that. The United States government's Controlled Substances Act was not a was was not overreaching when it reached inside of California to regulate our internal or intrastate medical cannabis market. Um, the now that intersects or now that's going to come in conflict with the government's own position that they're not going to enforce the laws against patients who are complying with state law. Hmm. Yeah. We, we now have a new kind of juxtaposition of positions. Absolutely. All right. Well, I'm really looking forward to uh, reporting on this as it goes through the various twists and turns of the legal system. What is the next step in this, Matt Cuman? Following, uh, as soon as I hang up with you, I'm going to try to get the rest of my documents ready for <laughs> filing tomorrow. Uh, we've been just uh, busy, busy, busy little beavers out here in uh, San Francisco and the uh, rest of the state with all my co-counsel. Alan Silver, too, in New Jersey, has been a critical part of our our lead team, and uh, we've all been trying to get these done. So we have to get the papers done today, and then tomorrow morning we will electronically file for a temporary restraining order, wait to hear from the court and see uh, whether they want to have us come in for the TRO hearing, or just have to see how we're going to proceed. Well, it's, it's very exciting, and I'm looking forward to these new strategies being employed uh, to try to protect California medical marijuana in general, and, and even more generally, just the rights of Americans. So thank you so much for doing this work. It, it needs to be done. Russ, it's great to talk to you, and I hope to see you down in Key West in a few weeks. I will be there in Key West. We will talk more about this here at, at, at that point. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Russ. Take Thank care. you, Matt Cuban from Cuban Summers, part of the normal legal committee uh, working hard to protect your rights and to force this federal government to reverse its ridiculous decisions in Rach v. Gonzalez and, uh, and realize that the Controlled Substance Act was uh, never intended to change the way... Uh, we do medicine in this country. Medicine is a purview of the states. It's time to recognize the state's 10th Amendment rights to do so. When we come back, a little time for radical rant. Not exactly, more uh, radical instruction. We'll be right back with some national survey on drug use and health information for you. Want more than just your normal show life? Get your daily fix of marijuana news and interviews on the normal daily audio stash. The weekday podcast available on iTunes and at stash.normal.org. the normal show live hear the hollywood hemptress hour with terry joyce every thursday at 8 p.m pacific with replays at 2 a.m also catch the morning replays every tuesday at 8 a.m and the weekend replay saturday at 5 a.m right here on the normal network 
marijuana and alcohol are the two most popular recreational drugs in America. Marijuana is relatively safe and has a low risk of dependence. Alcohol drinking is potentially fatal, dangerous to society, and is quite addictive. Marijuana is safer, so why are we driving people to drink? That's the question of the new book, Marijuana is Safer, So Why Are We Driving People to Drink? by Paul Armentano, Mason Tvert, and Steve Fox. Visit Amazon.com or ChelseaGreen.com today to order your copy of Marijuana is Safer or visit MarijuanaIsSafer.com. You want answers? I must fail, but I'm not going to take this anymore. You want answers? You have offended my family. I think I'm entitled. You want answers? I want the truth. And you have offended a Shaolin temple. You can't handle the truth. Surely you can't be serious. I am serious. And don't call me Shirley. Hoorah! Rant. All right, welcome back, everybody. You know, I've been thinking about what I should rant about this week and in general uh, lately. And sometimes I look at the list of things I've ranted about and realize that, gee, I've talked about these really detailed topics with a lot of uh, uh, complex issues in them, like we were just talking about judicial estoppel and all this stuff. And I realized that, you know, there might be new people coming on to this show, uh, joining up here that have no idea what I'm talking about. And some of these things that we take for granted as drug policy reformers ought to be given a little bit more instructional time. And so today I'm going to take a look at one of the best sources you can find as a drug policy reformer online to get the government's own information on the use of marijuana and other drugs in the United States. It all comes from the Substance Abuse Mental Health Services Administration, otherwise known as SAMHSA, S-A-M-H-S-A. If you're taking notes, you'll want to write that down, S-A-M-H-S-A. That's the, the main group, and they maintain something known as SAMDA, S A M. HDA, the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Data Archive. And this is a place where if you've seen all of the numerous charts and information that I bring up, uh, this is where it all comes from, is, is a lot of these charts. And another place that would be very interest, uh, very uh, important for you to know about is the National Survey on Drug Use and Health. And this sometimes is known as NSDUH, N-S-D-U-H, the National Survey on Drug Use and Health. And as you can see, this goes back to uh, 1994 on some of these. And you can get all sorts of information on National uh, Survey on Drug Use and Health. This is done every year uh, since the 70s. Uh, we can get data on this stuff. And it asks people in general about their use of different substances. Let me take you to the first National Survey link here. Na the latest National Survey on Drug Use and Health link, which will take you to their main page. Uh, oh, <laughs> take us to an error page. Isn't that nice? Right when I'm doing this live. Okay. So the national survey on drug use and health and all sorts of information, uh, trends in adolescent inhalant use, uh, the need for alcohol treatment, uh, marijuana use and perceived risk use of use amongst adolescents. And you can pick something like that. And looks like they're doing something out there with the uh, website because a lot of dead links. Let's go back to SAMDA instead. <laughs> Maybe we'll find something to talk about. The Substance Abuse Mental Health Data Archive, S-A-M-H-D-A. And as you get to this website, which it, it's got a really difficult web address. I don't want to read it out to you because it's long and it's got a lot of slashes and stuff. But just, just go to Google and look up S-A-M-H-D-A and you should be able to find this. And what's interesting about it is along the left-hand side, there's a navigation area here. And one of the navigation items will say analyzing data online. And another one will say quick tables. Now, if you just want a quick answer to some information, uh, quick tables is the easiest one to use. So I'll take you there to quick tables. And once you get to quick tables, there'll be a set of drop downs here where you have four different sets of data that you can look at. You can look at health behavior in school aged children, right? This is the information on the kids. National survey on drug use and health. That would be, you know, uh, age 12 and up use of various substances. The treatment episode data set admissions and treatment episode data set discharges, that's uh, rehab. 
this is like the st statistics of how many people go into rehab. So, you know, when I've told you that uh, 37 percent of the people who go to rehab for marijuana haven't used pot in the previous month, that's where that comes from. So if we start with National Survey on Drug Use and Health, which is the one you'll probably use the most because it's your basic, how many people smoke pot? How many people smoke pot this month? Uh, at what age do people start smoking pot? Th those kind of questions can be answered here. So when you drop it down, you will see the surveys going back all the way to 2001 online. And you can compare either the entire sample, which would be age 12 and up, or you can go to 12 to 17 year olds, you know, just the children. Let's go with the entire sample from the 2009 National Survey on Drug Use and Health. This will take you to a series of choices of which tables you would like to look up. Cigarettes, alcohol, cocaine, crack, hallucinogens, heroin, inhalants. Ah, there's marijuana. So you can click on marijuana use, and from there we will have more options to set up. For example, measures of marijuana use. How many people have ever used marijuana? And then, if you open that up, you'll have other choices like the age when they first used marijuana, how recently have they used marijuana, number of days they've used marijuana in the past 12 months. Respondent characteristics will give you gender, but other choices. This is how you would break the data down, you know, male or female. But there's also marital status, educational attainment, age group, race, ethnicity, and so on. Let's stick with gender for now. The confidence intervals, uh, unless you're doing a major statistical paper, you really don't have to worry about this one very much. Confidence intervals is, statistically speaking, how accurate is the data. Uh, don't worry about that for just general use. And then you have all sorts of options in here about how you can chart the data if you want to display a chart. Uh, I'm going to say no chart for now, but there's options there, 2D, 3D, what size, and so forth. So again, the question we're asking here on SAMHDA, S-A-M-H-D-A, how many people have ever used marijuana by gender? And when you create the table, the federal government will tell you that 46.5% of males have smoked marijuana, or used marijuana. 37.2% of females have tried marijuana. So this is where I talk about that 10 point gap or close to 10 point gap here between men and women's use of marijuana. There it is. And then that gives you 41.7% of the U.S. population who has ever used marijuana in their lifetime. Now, if you want to know how many people that is, that's where these numbers at the bottom help you out. Unweighted N is what they'll call this bottom line, and N is just a stats thing that means number of cases. So what they're telling you here is that they asked 26,000 men and they asked 29,000 women and so total, they talked to 55,000 people to get these statistics. Weighted N, the next line up, tells you if we extrapolate those number of people to the total number of people in the United States, you would have 122 million men, 129 million women for a total of 251 million Americans. Now, remember, this is age 12 and up, so there's more than that if you count kids. But from age 12 and up, there are 251 million Americans. So if you wanted to know exactly how many people have smoked marijuana, all you got to do is take 41.7% times that 251 million and you can say how many people, about 106, 106 million it turns out to be, how many people have smoked marijuana in their lifetime. And these kind of numbers are invaluable when you're uh, having an argument with a drug warrior, when, uh, you know, they're, they're, when you're, whenever you're trying to do this from our side, there's a lot of doubt about our accuracy. Well, you can see this is the government's own numbers, man. You can't doubt it. This is the government's own numbers. The other link that's available here next to QuickTables analyzing data online is much more detailed. It gives you all of these other studies, substance abuse treatment services, alcohol and drug services studies, California data, gambling impacts. I mean, just more stuff than you can shake a stick at. And even if you do just pick, say, the National Survey on Drug Use and Health and analyze 2009, the the level of data you're going to get through analyzing data online is incredible. Every single variable that they have in this database is available for us to be able to access and be able to come up with information about. This is how I was able to extract, for example, how many 
18 and up have smoked marijuana because from here you can get to the identification variables you can get to the exact core substance use the exact age and demographics of the people i encourage you check out sam hda this is normal show live the voice of the marijuana nation all right, for Cannabis Carry, I'm Radical Russ. Thanks for joining us. That's it for the podcast. Join us for Toker Talk Radio in Hour 2. And until next time, take care of each other, Tokers.